Okay. So welcome, welcome to our session on small, on small business, big impact, pivoting SMEs. I'm going to say that it's mostly post-COVID or somewhat post-COVID, but I'm going to expand this to during COVID and post-COVID. Um, we are uh, a small group today, and it'll be more conversational and rather than having a, a moderated panel per se. Um, there's a lot of excellent experience, and I uh, and I guess a couple hundred years here of um, of different of people of people's experience in small uh, businesses and in memberships in YPO and in um, in in deals and in running in running startups and, and large companies. Um, so I uh, would like to introduce. Uh, Brett Hickey, and um, um, he has 20 years of private investing and investment banking experience with over 15 years spent directly in the U.S. lower middle market. He's completed over 125 private equity, private credit, and secondary fund investments. Brett is the founder and CEO of Star Mountain Capital, a multi-billion dollar specialized private investment firm. It employs data-driven approach to provide value-added debt and equity capital to establish small and medium-sized private companies leveraging its scale-driven resources and long-standing relationships. Star Mountain also has a secondary fund investment business providing early liquidity for investors in lower middle market credit and private equity funds. Driven by culture and stakeholder alignment, Star Mountain has been recognized as one of the best places to work by cranes and pensions and investments in both 2020 and 2019. Brett, please tell me how you feel. Please first define uh, what uh, what small and medium uh, sized private uh, companies are, your sweet spot, and how you see them living through COVID and post COVID? And good questions. First of all, we think of lower middle market businesses as companies that have grown beyond the startup phase of life, typically with at least 15 million in existing annual revenues, but companies that are not yet a larger business that have been fully institutionalized and that's really the specialization of Star Mountain Capital is to help take high quality management teams, good products and services and help take those businesses to the next level with a combination of debt capital and equity capital as a flexible capital solution partner to founder, family and other investor owned private companies. And how have they uh, weathered um, 2020 and how are they emerging? Depends on the type of business. In general, we think of it as a bit of a two-pronged outcome that has occurred. We have companies on the technology, in the technology sectors such as telehealth that have grown dramatically during COVID and during the downturn. We have other companies at the other end such as uh, private school chains and preschools or pet hotel boarding and grooming that have had impacts during the downturn but have now been re-emerging quite rapidly uh, that are otherwise defensive businesses across most type of economic downturns. The pandemic, of course, was the first that in my 20-year investment career and hopefully the last for all of us. But um, And then in the, in the middle, a lot of the businesses were highly unaffected, such as peanut hauling companies and things of that nature. And so on balance, it has, uh, I think, been positive for a lot of the long-term trends that we have viewed as likely, such as technology-driven businesses, online advertising, marketing. Uh, we, we believe the world has been going this way for a long time, and the pandemic just forced that uh, even more aggressively. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to 
uh, introduce Wayne Lee. He's president of PowerTech, a global fitness equipment distributor. He oversees all aspects of business from manufacturing in China to marketing in Europe. He was previously with Deloitte's financial advisory services, providing transactional support to large multinational Fortune 1000 companies. He is a dual chapter member of Young Presidents Organization, YPO, and Global One in Sea Dragon, a Chinese-speaking YPO chapter based in Asia. He has a master's in, from Columbia, in finance from Columbia University, an MBA from the Drucker School of Management at Claremont Colleges, and his undergraduate degree, believe it or not, is in physics at the University of California, Berkeley. He holds a black belt in karate and is a, a scuba diver, PADI certified. He's currently working on his private pilot license and lives in Los Angeles with his two daughters and son. So tell us how, how the opportunity, what's happened to your business in, during COVID and how you have planned for not experiencing 500% growth in 2021. <laughs> so, so obviously we were a beneficiary of the COVID pandemic and it's um, unusual and strange to kind of feel so much growth with a lot of people suffering around the world. So uh, we do our best by focusing on you know, our, our core statement which is committed to stronger lives making everybody stronger uh, not only physically but also emotionally and, and mentally um, and helping you know develop more content for people who want to train at home so I think that um, you know we also have a family business which is in the paddle sports paddleboard space which initially had a downturn but because of uh, social distancing and you know water sports becoming um, one of the only outlets for you, for people to really be outside uh, the paddleboard business also took off. So in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's a really challenging dynamic trying to manage the growth because of the impact not only on our supply chain, but also, you know, globally overall with the raw material supplies, as well as, um, you know, the delivery of the products to the end users. Okay. T you know, now that you brought up, um, you know, the supply chain, I'd love to hear more about it and how it's impacting, you know, small and medium businesses. Sure. Uh, I think that uh, there is a macroeconomic uh, imbalance in trade between China and the rest of the world. And as China is becoming more insulated, there's a lot less trade that going into China. So that causes a, a net effect of not only uh, the the payment, the trade in pallets in terms of payments between the China and the rest of the world, but also all the materials that are required to export uh, products out of China. So, for example, the ocean freight companies, as well as the, um, the containers, uh, the raw material supplies that are that are like coming out of China is is a lot more than the raw material supplies that are going into China. So, there's a lot of these challenges that are causing uh, not only uh, difficulties in, in, in securing goods, but also um, the, what do you call it, the, the needs of the, of the people that require these goods to, for everyday living. I mean, you know, there's um, a lack of, uh, you know, what do you call it, appliances. There's a lack of, um, you know, daily, necess the daily necessities that were coming out of China. <clears throat> and... So all, all that is causing a crunch of not only the supply chain, but also, you know, inflation. I think that is going to be causing a huge impact globally that we haven't really seen in, in, in the past and since like the 1980s. Um, how about Brett? How, have, how has the supply chain issues affected your companies? It's uh, been an interesting one. We have uh, different consumer technology companies that we thought could have had a bigger impact 
early on. Uh, thankfully, we had some diversified manufacturing locations in the U.S. and Mexico and other that helped outside of China. But ultimately, the disruption we've had, thankfully, has been pretty small. But uh, I think there still is a risk it out there. And I see a lot of supply chain challenges across other goods, having uh, recently moved into a new home and been purchasing different things, including um, probably would have been helpful um, had I met Wayne um, six months ago for some things that uh, we were building and doing in our house. It, it is amazing how many things from basic type of gym equipment to um, semiconductors and chips, microchips, have been disrupted. So I think it's, um, it is a major question and challenge. I know from a, a, a political standpoint, there's a lot of discussion in trying to onshore certain things, although I'm sure Wayne would know a lot more about that than I would. And I can only imagine the cost of uh, changing um, the way things are manufactured and produced, uh, I can't imagine would be very easy to say the least especially with the labor shortages that we also have in the aging demographic, the overlay on top of that. So um, by way of introduction to me, I had an early career in corporate finance and mergers and acquisitions. And I was also president of an 1100 person company and uh, number two in partner in a company that I prepared and packaged uh, to sell very successfully to AIG. In the last 12 years, I foc I've been focusing on startup, for-profit, social impact investments and related advisory. And the first, I got very lucky on the first deal that I did. I am the first angel investor in Leapfrog Investments. Uh, Andy Cooper, the founder, was 31, had no background in, he never worked for a for-profit company he never, didn't know anything about funds and didn't know anything about finance. And we launched that at the Clinton Global Initiative in September 08, the same month that Lehman and, and Bear Stearns and the, there was no place to hide in the world at that time with a new asset class because our theory of change had to do with um, people rise out of poverty, but they don't have a safety net. So one untoward event will knock the many levels back down. So um, that, I mean, we begged for money. We got probably over a million dollars of free legal because the insurance departments at, at Riley and Ryan had nothing really for their uh, staff lawyers to do. And today we are, um, we are pro profit with purpose equity funds. We're over $2 billion of assets under management. Our portfolio companies grow have been growing at 26 per year. Um, and we reach 220 million people with the goods and services of our companies. But most importantly, about close to 80% of those consumers live under $10 a day. We work across 35 emerging markets and we support 130,000 livelihoods. Despite lots of claims and, and business being kind of halted in the parts, particularly in the parts of the world where leapfrog is, which is a lot in, in Africa, Southeast Asia, and India, we, our portfolio valuations grew 22% last year. Another company that I'm the founding investor, we successfully sold in February, 2020, and that is purpose.com, Purpose Global. We build and support movements to advance the fight for an open, just, and habitable world. We have a staff of 160 around the world, and we've impacted a billion people. When our business sort of halted in uh, April-ish 2020, uh, the CEO, uh, went, who's friendly with the UN, actually uh, came up with a program called Verified. And we raised millions of dollars to get out truthful information around the world. Now the focus is not only adding to the truthful information, but dealing with vaccine hesitancy. So um, those are two companies. In general, 
the these various investments um, were uh, impacted greatly by COVID. Fundraising stopped, and all these businesses pretty much need fundraising. Startups need fundraising every year, but we both got through it, and uh, within three or four months, the markets changed. Um, in and we also some of the some of the companies that were further along, we pushed some COVID related initiatives like doing free pilots in hospitals and so on and so forth and raising funds for uh, medical debt forgiveness and various activities like that. Um, what is, what's been, what's been really important in this, in how things have unfolded is that I think the world is much more interested in impact. And I think that most companies today need to think about that for their stakeholders, which would be their shareholders, their employees, and their customers. So I'd love to hear if you feel that that has been a kind of a, a, a an emerging theme or that people and companies have actually taken real action. Brett, do you want to start off? I, I think companies have taken a varying degree of action depending on the business and the sector and the ownership. I know in the investment industry, the institutional investors that we have, which also includes family office and a pretty wide range of folks, um, the public pensions, the private pensions and other folks endowments foundations are more and more focused on ESG and what people are doing and how they're operating and uh, I think it depends on the investor and depends on the business, but I think people are more aware in general of the impact they're having and thinking about cultures. I sit on the global board, for example, of Harvard's alumni entrepreneurs. And 20 years ago, the focus around private equity and hedge funds was really the, the most sought after club to be in. And now as we observe what the interests are of the, of the younger population. And I say this because any great business needs to focus on talent as a core aspect. And if you want to attract today's top talent, they want more than just a career. They, I think, really define themselves as, as their career, what they stand for, what they're doing. And that matters a lot to them. So I think that the, the private equity and investment industry is shifting to start to, I think, slowly understand that better. That was one of the reasons in founding Star Mountain 11 years ago. Um, but certainly across other sectors, you look at technology, consumer goods, I'm sure with, with health and fitness and so forth, uh, with Wayne's business that I'm sure you would attest to that, that people care about what they're doing and what they're trying to do, not just, hey, I want to go make as much money as I can, which 20 years ago, I think, that was the case that a lot of people come out of schools and they really looked at their purposeful life and their for-profit life is different today. I think they really look at them much more integrated, which, which I think is positive uh, for society in general and brings more awareness and, and stakeholder alignment, to, including the environment being one of those stakeholders that we all participate in and with. Okay, great. And Wayne, how do you feel? Definitely, I think uh, every company is a lot more aware of their social mission and what they represent, how um, how their products are made, you know, how their products are distributed. The uh, what do you call it? Carbon footprint that uh, is is utilized for not only the manufacturing process but also the distribution of the product itself. We do see a lot more of our consumers being more aware of not only the the natural environment, also their um, their bodies, what they eat, you know, how they eat it. it. Before it was, you know, about like nutraceuticals being what they are, but now it's about like, you know, where where did it come from? Is it, it come from a plant, or did it come from certain types of plants? How was that plant uh, even even grown? Right. So there is definitely a shift. Uh, you can see that with uh, Whole Foods being like such big giant uh, presence now in the, in the supermarket space. Uh, definitely you see like uh, my sister was involved in a company called Plum Organics and 
they were organic baby food and uh you know she was at this uh, conference called expo west which is an organic natural food expo and it went from like literally one hall that you can walk in one afternoon to several halls that three days you can probably not walk at all so there's definitely a shift in terms of perspective on and, and awareness on the environment and the social missions that each company takes. And um, what's interesting about your comment about um, just following up on Brett in terms of uh, Harvard and, and, you know, which I bank investment bank you were going to work for and, and, and or hedge funds and so on and so forth. Um, my daughter graduated Harvard Business School in 2014, and that era was a lot more about impact. And a lot of uh, graduates actually started their own businesses instead of going into uh, the, the old classic fields of, of banking. Um, so it was an interesting, and she, and she went off to India to work on startups. <laughs> so she worked in India for four years. Um, so I do feel that talent um, through all of this has um, sort of shifted their priorities, particularly uh, younger talent, and they don't want to work incessantly as we do. And they um, definitely um, state their preferences in, in job interviews. And it happens to be a big issue, like it, at Purpose, for instance, Everybody has kind of a side hustle, whether it's some activist organization or some mission uh, or even things from a cooking blog or healthy eating blog. And uh, uh, staff today uh, wants to have purposeful jobs, even if they're not necessarily working at uh, purposeful companies. Do you find that, how do you find that is with attracting talent? At, at your companies. I'm happy to go first if you want. Um, we, as you mentioned at the beginning of this, we've won a number of awards for best place to work in the, the broader finance industry as well as New York City where, where we're headquartered in, in one of our 20 locations across the United States. The uh, big thing we find that with, with the younger generation that is very driven and very passionate and has taken advantage of all the data and information that's available to them via the internet that wasn't before when the rest of us were younger and went through college. We didn't have the kind of information people have today. What we found at Sur Mountain is there are people still that are very hungry, very driven, very passionate, dedicated, loyal, and have been able to consume and take advantage of that data, but to inspire them and motivate them in the way that I was when I was you know, an investment banking analyst 20 or so years ago wasn't, it, it isn't just money. They want to be treated like young junior partners. And to that end, with our roughly 50 people plus 30 additional operating partners at Star Mountain, they all get equity. Um, more akin to, if you think of a technology type of startup or something like that, where people are, you know, really banding together. And I think the economic alignment of interest and also creating careers for them, not jobs. Uh, examples of that would be making sure that even first-year analysts with us, they get two layers of operational leverage. We have two full-time offices in India that provide operational leverage to our first year out of undergrads in, um, in New York, as well as year-round internship programs. So even our interns are getting a little bit of operational leverage and we find that that satisfaction where they are less satisfied just kind of grinding through and putting their dues in. Um, but if, if you can create an infrastructure for them, we're incredibly impressed by some of the talent that's out there today. But they, they want more. They want more faster. And you have to think differently about your business model, we believe, which, which I think is okay. Um, if we all had those same opportunities, we probably would have wanted it too. <laughs> True. And they like lots of feedback. <laughs> I find <them. laughs> How about you, Wayne? You're, you, you both understand training and stronger lives concept and kind of, you know, respect and contributions in terms of your uh, business mission and, you know, commitment. 
How do you find both employees who are working for you and people you met through YPO and, and people that you sit on the advisory board of the, of the uh, graduate school, the MBA program? It's to a clock. Yeah, certainly. I feel like uh, it's all about alignment, right? And the, definitely social ventures and the trends in the for for uh, protecting the environment as well as you know, being more holistic about not just your job separating it. Um, they all like when we were growing up, it was about work life balance, right? But everybody I interview is more about like work life integration. So it's not necessarily just you know separating those two aspects of your life is about integrating them and being holistic about your approach, not only about your job, but your career, uh, how your, how your family life integrates into, you know, what you're doing and especially resonates with our uh, employees as well as our customers. Our customers, you know, want to see, we, we sponsor many athletes and, you know, the customers want to see, you know, the athletes being not just, uh, exercising, but about informing them about, um, you know, lifestyle and, and, uh, diet and uh, as well as just, as well as the exercise, but it's a more complete picture rather than just how to, you know, build your biceps or how to like get their eight pack ass and stuff like that. So, and the employees are also there as well. Uh, you can see the enthusiasm that we're not just pushing fitness, but we're pushing a certain lifestyle, a certain type of, you know, um, mentality in terms of the employees helping out the consumers or like the dealers or the international uh, constituents partners that we have and trying to make sure that like, you know, they have all of the components and all of the tools that are necessary to support them in whatever they're trying to do, whether it's, you know, exercise or mentally building up a uh, profile that they need to compete. Okay, um, building on some of your nonprofit work, um, tell me what you're excited about or what projects you find that are really interesting to you. Do you want to go first, Wayne? Certainly, I, 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 I'm involved in, uh, you know, obviously the Drucker School as well as uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills, um, their, their business program as well. Um, Something that's really interesting is that uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills is more of a s social program. It was originally supposed to be located in Palos Verdes, but because of the Wasp riots, um, because of the demand of the inner cities, they, they relocated that campus uh, into Compton, right? So that business program, that, that university uh, has the highest amount of uh, first generation college students. Um, the average age is a lot older and then uh, a lot of these uh, students come from very uh, challenged backgrounds. So um, I think that like edu education is the key moving forward for anything. So uh, as long as people are more aware and more educated, then they have more opportunities moving forward. So, you know, that's the focus that I, I, I tend to focus my time and effort and energy uh, in the nonprofit sector. Nice. My, my nonprofit activities, I, I try to integrate as much as I can with where I think that myself and, and my family and firm can add the most value. Uh, and that includes connecting into small businesses across America. You mentioned the number of businesses uh, earlier on over 30 million, but the couple other stats I think that are interesting about the U.S. economy and, and Canada in particular is that it's where somewhere between 50 and 90 percent of people are employed. And unlike a larger institution that can have a veterans program, for example, um, most small businesses, it's hard for them to find veterans, figure out how to analyze, train, onboard, and manage. Yet you have a massive group of highly driven, dedicated people that I think hopefully most people would agree that we all owe at least some type of duty of care to try to assist them transitioning from their, um, you know, in, into their civilian careers, as they would refer to it as. And, and I was not uh, in the military for any sake of, um, or for sake of clarity. I used to speed skate the national team, and I found it was hard to transition from speed skating to something that you could pay the bills with. But at least I knew 
right up front that there was no money in speed skating, other like, unlike my other friends in Canada with hockey that tried putting all their eggs in one basket and the odd one it worked out. Most didn't, of course, you can imagine. But that, that really is what got me thinking initially with our foundation that supports women. My mother, unfortunately, passed with cancer when I was very young and she was 39. And so we support women, cancer, things of that nature, which is just purely a personal thing and relates to health and wellness and fitness. And I think that there's far too little proactive health management out there and too much reactive trying to solve the problems afterwards. And the reality is with a lot of challenges, once you have them, it's tough, right? The key is how do you avoid them? How do you have healthy, positive, physical and mental lifestyles? And so things like Wayne's doing are incredibly valuable and and important. Um, But then you think about people and their livelihoods and that's important as well. And so we initially helped a lot with women And I think COVID actually will be very positive on that front. Uh, A lot of working mothers, as my wife was as well, it's tough. Very tough on a lot of them if they want to be raising families. And and you obviously know this better than I would. But it's, it's tough. And I think the ability to now allow for more flexible location based work, I think and hope will assist a lot. But I think veterans is something that we all should think about how we can engage with and give back to. And so given the number of private businesses that we invest in the United States and relations we have, we try to connect those dots and educate business owners that there's a lot of passionate driven people and help them find jobs that are also passionate and driven. We find that a lot of veterans, once they go work for a big corporation, sometimes hard, they go from a career where they have a high impact, real decision-making, you know, what they do really matters and all of a sudden into more of a very narrow job function and scope. And that's hard for them uh, psycho- psychologically to adapt into, especially if the organization doesn't have a good way of assisting with that adaptation. Whereas our belief is you have passionate driven entrepreneurial businesses, which you both are involved in as owners and investors as well as we are. And that, our guess is that on average, those companies are going to be more fulfilling careers for veterans that really want engaged, passionate careers, but it's how do we connect all of them? So that's one of the bigger missions that Star Mountain's charitable foundation is focused on from a philanthropic initiative, uh, Sari. Uh, that's great. I sit on the board of Digital Divide Data, and we have a company called Liberty Source in Hamden, Virginia. We located there... Uh, not so much to address the veterans, although a lot of veterans work there because that's a hub of the Air Force, uh, Navy, Army, and, and, um, and post-Army kind of life. And what we really, the, the, it was a startup. We've had, we have about, I don't know, 250 people. Um, the process has to do with the fact that the spouses of the military tend to be underemployed or unemployed because they're moving around every three years. So they work for us when they live there, and frankly, and if they're good, they continue on. And with COVID, there's, there's been a lot more work as it relates to learning how to work remote, and they could actually have jobs for the long term, and we've addressed more of the flexible hours and so on and so forth. And uh, it has to do with accounting and other administrative financial services for, for big companies that have you know, instead of offshoring the staff, that kind of work, we've been able to onshore that work at affordable rates. And uh, and those have been some of the corporate mandates in terms of employees. Another company that I sit on the, I'm a member, a member of the advisory committee is called Silver Lining um, Impact 5X Economic Justice Initiative. And it has to do with a actually just, received uh, a grant from J.P. Morgan Chase for a million dollars, and that is to actually help entrepreneurs build businesses from hair salons to small retail sites to things that are, you know, quite a bit bigger. But it's giving them what they call slap tools. They have a whole system of both uh, training and one-on-one mentoring, which are mostly volunteers, 
to to help build these businesses and to help them with their with their networks. So um, and uh, we're actually um, covering. We just awarded a hundred new businesses. There were five hundred applicants for you know getting this slap with slap package and one on one mentoring, and that's to build businesses and. Just some mentoring at the right time can also make a huge difference. So um, anyway, um, are there any other things you'd like to, st any new trends that you see because the world has been shaken and now uh, with people getting vaccinated that we're kind of moving, will never be the same, but do you have any closing remarks on, on impact and small businesses and medium businesses and going forward. Okay, my, my two cents is that every big business started as a small business for the most part, I guess you have a corporate carve out as a slight exception. I think entrepreneurialism is, is very much alive. I think innovation and change and behavior and what we do and how we do it uh, is, is perhaps more prominent today than it's ever been. And therefore the opportunities in small and medium sized businesses as entrepreneurs, investors, and so forth is perhaps as exciting and robust as it's ever been. Particularly when you look at what you can achieve, if you can build a good sized business that can access anywhere near the public market valuations at absolute all time highs, um, just creates even more demand for that. And I think that's important for innovation, globalization. And I think there's a lot of positive societal benefits as well to that. It don't, doesn't get spoken about as much, but it's the smaller businesses and people that are willing to take real risks and, and most often right, have failure, at least in the startup phase, uh, to grow and push hard. So it's um, fun to support them. And great to see some awesome, passionate business models and, and business owners out there. Thanks. Nice insights. Wayne, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Brett. I think that uh, entrepreneurs are the drivers of innovation in the, in the future and definitely it's going to be the changes in the new way of doing business are going to come from entrepreneurs. And, uh, you know, the statistics from Bureau, Bureau, Bureau of Labor talks about how 97% uh, of the population actually work for firms that are less than 10 people. So, um, that's that's a testament to the power of the small businesses that are you know, in the United States and across globally. I think that a larger, also another component is, you know, the aging baby boomers and their businesses that are going to be falling on to the second generation. And I don't, I, I feel like the, the the millennials and the the ones that are going to be taking over are going to transform these traditional businesses into more of a future business that would be more sustainable than um, what the baby boomers have, have created. Nice, um, I agree. Um, what's exciting today is that uh, because of the uh, disruptive tech tools um, that you could actually build a business and a more frictionless business a lot easier. So one of my startups needed a new logo and re and like branding and so on and they went to a site called 99design.com and for $1,200 they had a competition and we got, I would say we, we had a hundred submissions, but I would say we had, we narrowed it down to five really kind of amazing logo sort of tagline designs. And it's, it's kind of amazing to be able to get that quality work at a very inexpensive and quick turnaround. So I'm very excited about uh, both tech and I'm very excited that there's a more impact view on the DNA of companies and customers, employees and owners. So thank you very much and uh, really appreciate your time, your insights and what an impressive group. So look forward to speaking to you after the call. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Great, Dale. Thanks, Harry. Bye.